All right. Um, so hi, I'm uh, Rob Clark, and I'm going to give a quick update on the state of uh, open and free SOC graphics. Um, so it's actually SOC graphics, not just ARM graphics, because there's at least one MIPS platform in here as well. Um, so the basic history, and that's kind of small, I suppose. I hope that's kind of readable. Um, the history is, you know, a few years back, we're starting to see more uh, ARM and similar SOC devices, people doing more things with tablets. And that's all great, except for from a Linux open source graphics standpoint. Um, you know, I mean, my concern, and I think some other people's concern, is, hey, we finally got things to a pretty good state on desktop with uh, open source graphics. Sorry. Um, so a, a couple of years ago, uh, Luke with the uh, Molly project managed to figure out how to draw some triangles and a few things. And that kind of uh, inspired myself and a few other people to say, hey, let's, let's start uh, uh, picking at these uh, blob drivers and see what we can come up with. Um, so today I'm going to cover four different uh, driver projects, which are in various states of, of usability for four different uh, embedded SOC GPUs. So the uh, and the the order that I'm covering is is not chronological or anything. It's just kind of random. So the the first project is uh, Etnaviv. It's a reverse engineered gallium driver for the Vo uh, Vivanti GPU. Uh, the next one is Great, which is a gallium driver for Tegra, and then Lima. They're working on a uh, DRI Classic driver for Molly 200, 400. And then finally, the, <coughs> the one that I'm most familiar with uh, for Adreno, which is a gallium driver for um, Qualcomm's Adreno 200 and 300 and future devices. Um, so uh, first, a little bit about the, uh <coughs> about the hardware. Um, the Vivanti is at least GLES2 class hardware. Some of the newer ones are GLES3 and OpenCL class. Um, it's a unified shader architecture, which is nice from a reverse engineering standpoint because there's only one shader ISA to, to work out, and generally the shader ISA is the hardest thing to, to sort out. Um, it does 2x and 4x uh, multi-sample. Um, it's um, an immediate mode renderer, so it's not a, a tile-based architecture. So of the four different pro uh, GPUs covered here, two are immediate mode and two are some sort of tiling, uh, tiler architecture. Um, and it, its support is pretty pretty typical for a GLES, which is things, the shaders and, and, and so on. Yeah, single. Uh, so only one of these is not uh, single command stream. So the shader ISA is actually pretty nice. It's a pretty close match to TGSI. It's a, uh, yeah, that's a little bit hard to read, but it's a, uh, a VEC4 architecture, which is nice because TGSI is VEC4 oriented. Um, you don't have to, uh, it's, the hardware handles dependencies between instructions, so you don't have to insert no ops or do do crazy things. So, um, and it's 32-bit uh, precision. It's the instructions are fairly fat. Uh, each instruction is 128 bits, but it's you know same size instruction, which makes reversing pretty easy because once you figure out the you know you know early on the place where one instruction ends and the next instruction begins. Um, the current status, uh, they have a working working Gallium driver. It can do things like playing Quake. Uh, currently, they don't have any way to do DRI2, so they're just using FBDEV backend. Um, so a uh, DRM kernel driver and a DDX would help them out to uh, to be able to do X, X11. Um, 
it's been progressing actually very fast. It's the late, the last, I'd say, or I'd say most recent uh, reverse engineering project to start. It just started really at the, uh, towards the end of last year. Um, but, you know, nice simple shader ISA and nice traditional hardware make, has helped them a lot to make it easy to figure out, let's say. Um, and uh, here you can see some progress over just over a little bit over the course of a, uh, of a month of the same, you know, quake. You know, at the, at the beginning in, towards the end of July, you have something that doesn't look really anything like what it's supposed to. And, you know, over the next few weeks, it gets to the point of actually rendering correctly, which is kind of, kind of nice to see that sort of uh, fast progress. So, uh, the next one up is uh, is great. The the uh, the uh, project for uh, for uh, Tegra. You'll you'll notice most of the names are anagrams of the original GPU, with one exception, which was already an anagram of a GPU um, name. So Tegra is GLES two class hardware. Um, separate vertex and fragment shaders. Um, it's a fairly minimalistic, um, both the vertex and fragment shaders are fairly minimalistic in, in terms of capabilities. So uh, no branching or loops. Um, you can only do loops that can be completely unrolled, <coughs> unrolled by the compiler. Um, but uh, especially on the newer devices, they manage to get pretty good performance by uh, really massive number of, uh, of vertex and fragment uh, cores. Um, you know, again, 2x multi-sample, the, the Tegra 4 stuff can do 4x. Um, it's also immediate mode renderer, um, similar, similar capabilities to the Vivante as far as formats, so 2D textures, cube maps, and of course, mipmap for uh, multi-sampling on Tegra. Does it support any of the um, so various generations of NVIDIA GPUs have had some unusual multi-sampling modes, like the the Quincux or whatever it is, and and some other modes. Does does Tegra have some of those also? Um, or do you know? Not that we know of. Okay. Uh, I mean, one thing about reverse engineering. You know, sometimes the hardware might support things that the blob driver doesn't and is not mentioned in any marketing literature anywhere, so you kind of don't know completely. Um, so Tegra 3 and before had a 20-bit depth buffer. Tegra 4 bumps that up to 24-bit depth buffer. And then, of course, 8-bit stencil. Um, so as far as devices, um, for Tegra 2, there's a trim slot, uh, the trim slice and the uh, AC100 netbook. Both of those are pretty nice little devices to hack on. Um, the uh, Tegra 3, uh, the original Nexus 7, um, and this is not a complete list. It was just kind of devices I knew off the top of my head. Um, Tegra 4 is in Shield, and I think well, it doesn't really help, but it's in the new Surface tablet from Microsoft, but <laughs> um, and probably some other things. Um, it's a little bit more. Um, so the Vertex shader is actually not too bad on Tegra. It's a VLIW Vec4 plus Scalar co-dispatch, um, so you can do normal ALU operations like add, multiply and so on on a, a VEC4, and then combine that with uh, um, what the guy working on is called SFU. I think maybe NVIDIA actually calls it MFU um, instruction, like a recip square root or sine, cosine, and so on. Um, and uh, its precision is 32-bit float. Um, the fragment shader I saw, on the other hand, is a little bit more weird. It's not quite Molly levels of weird, but um, but it's definitely, I'd say, more weird than any of the other 
non Mali uh, uh, SOC GPUs. It's, it basically consists of three separate instruction streams, um, which get sequenced somehow. Um, there's a uh, one instruction stream has got the varying fetch and special function unit operations, a second instruction stream with texture fetch, and a third instruction with normal ALU operations. And these, they're kind of starting to understand how the, those different instruction streams get sequenced, but that's kind of one of the areas they're still trying to, to figure out uh, better. Um, the ALU stream is a little bit uh, interesting because it really only has four different op codes. It's got a multiply, add, a min, a max, and a conditional select. And then the different the different source register arguments can, there's special values for hard-coded zero and one. So you can combine, for example, mad to do multiply or add or various different things. Um, there are constant registers, so, and you can also, the ALU instructions come in either packets of um, three scalar instructions plus an embedded constant or four. So yeah, you can do other constants, but the, um, the hard-coded one and zero are kind of like a, I guess like a non-memory access fast path to be able to do many different things with those uh, combinations of four different instructions. Um, and the precision is a 20-bit 20, 20 floating point. Um, so yeah, the, the trick is to understand how the hardware sequences those three different instruction streams, how they get merged together and executed as one, one program. And that's, that's kind of about the point where they are now on, uh, on the reverse engineering effort. So it's a, probably, I'd say, the earliest. It's at the earliest research stage compared to the other um, open source drivers, you know, they can do the basic stuff, command stream capture and replay. The basic GL state um, is, is understood. The vertex shader ISO is pretty well understood. Mainly they need to understand better the fragment shader ISO. There's a basic skeleton for a gallium driver which can do like clears, but uh, without, without having the, the fragment shader ISO there's not too much more that you can do. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, progress is, is coming along. So hopefully next year there's something uh, uh, more functional to report on. Um, so the, the third GPU to cover is uh, the Molly. And this is actually roughly two different generations. Is a Molly 200 and 400. Um, which are GLES-2 class hardware, separate vertex and fragment shaders. Um, the Mali 400, uh, you can scale up by adding more uh, pixel processor fragment shader units. Um, this one, unlike the previous two, is uh, it's what I call tile-based immediate mode uh, renderer. So as opposed to like SGX, which is deferred per pixel uh, tile rendering. Um, what that means is you want to buffer up as many of the draw calls as you can, and then you execute all of them for each tile. Um, but within, within the tile, it works like an immediate mode renderer. So the new generation of Molly, which hasn't been looked at quite as much so far, is a GLES-3 class hardware and OpenCL. They switched to a unified shader ISA. Um, so the the guy who did uh, uh, Connor Abbott, who did who talked at uh, Fosdom at the beginning of the year and has done most of the the compiler work for for Molly, has started poking at the uh, the uh, compiler for the T six hundred. But uh, again, it's you know tile based immediate mode. It has a few more features like support for 3D textures. Um, notable, it is the one 
of the uh, uh, SOC graphics GPUs that support 64-bit um, types. So it actually f supports full OpenCL profile, not just embedded profile. Um, the uh, Avanti and uh, Adreno stuff only supports 32-bit uh, types. Um, because this, because ARM licenses out the GPU core to a lot of different SOC vendors, it's actually on quite a lot of devices. So Chromebook and Nexus 10 have the Mali 600. Um, Mali 200, 400 is on a lot of, you know, all winner, Exynos 4, IntelliChips, so on. So, I mean, that's nice. That means it's available on some of these, like, Odroid type boards, which are, um, generally a lot easier to work on compared to like a form factor device like a phone uh, which tends to have lockdown bootloaders and other headaches like that. Um, so the Mali hardware architecture, unlike most of the others, the CPU is actually explicitly scheduling the, uh, the vertex processing and the uh, fragment processing. Um, which lets them do some interesting tricks, like um, they can kick off the geometry processing before the V-blank happens and the next buffer to render into is available. Um, the, uh, when you have multiple pixel pipe uh, cores, uh, the CPU is explicitly dividing up the work uh, across them. You know, as opposed to more traditional GPU architecture where you have some sort of command processor which is actually sequencing the geometry to, to pixel to, to fragment transition. Um, so where uh, Molly gets weird is the, uh, the vertex and fragment shaders. They're, these are, yeah, more weird than than anything else I've seen. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, especially with the lights on in the front, but um, you can, I can, well, I'll post, I'll post the slides later so you, you can look at it. But uh, this, so earlier I showed the exact same, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Earlier I showed the, you know, disassembly for a couple others for a very simple uh, vertex shader. It's just a matrix multiply. And this is the disassembly for that. Um, you know, whereas on the Vivante it's a multiply plus three multiply adds. Yeah, this is the, how it looks on, uh, on the uh, uh, Molly. I mean, the, the kind of, um, philosophy behind the, the, the shader cores on Molly was make the compiler do everything. Put all the smarts in the compiler and keep the hardware simple. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, a GPU is a little bit different from a CPU because it doesn't really, yeah. But yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the flip side, you notice, like if you look at the history of benchmarks on the, the Molly stuff, they've got pretty big performance boosts by driver updates, which, i.e., they made the compiler smarter and it got much faster. Um, right, yeah. It's right, right, right. So yeah, I, I don't envy... Uh, anyone writing compilers for these things. But uh, the, uh, the Vertex shader, um, single-threaded but deeply pipelined with VLIW instructions, where each instruction, there's a, um, at the beginning, of, um, at the beginning there's a uh, field that tells it which of the subparts of the instructions are invalid, but each instruction can encode two additions, two multiplications, one complex op, like square root, recip square root, and so on. Um, one pass through, one attribute load, one register load, one uniform or temporary load, and one store. 
Um, so you notice you can't actually have multiple source register um, in an instruction. The um, normal mode of operation, you're taking values directly out of the output of an add or a multiply in the previous instruction and routing it into a uh, unit on the next instruction. So the storing a result to a register or loading a result from a register is really just a slow fallback in the case that you can't actually schedule the instructions properly to take the output of the previous instruction directly into the next. Um, so the pass through gives you like a one cycle hold. So if, 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 so in the case where you can't schedule instructions to take the output of one unit directly into the input of another unit, you have two options. You can route it through the pass through to give you a hold of that value for the next instruction or you can save it to a, a register. And that's only for a single register? That's only for a single register in this case? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not actually, the pass through is not, it's, you can kind of think of it like a register. I mean, it's maybe a little bit analogous to like the Radeon where you have previous value thing, but it's, it's not quite the same. Um, And the, the frag fragment shader is also weird in slightly different ways. Um, it's got a, I think they're reckoning, 128-stage pipeline. So it's a really massively deep pipeline. And multiple threads are, uh, um, yeah, it, it's... Um, and for reverse engineering, it's a little bit more tricky because it's not fixed instruction length. The instructions can be anything from 32 bits to 576 bits. Um, and similar, each instruction encodes multiple things. So uh, yeah, each it's. Yeah, each instruction encodes up to six VEC4 operations plus special const and, and, and so on. And this one, the precision is 16-bit floating point. So of, of all these, it's the lowest precision. Um, so the current status, other than just poking at the compiler on the Molly 600, um, most of the work has been focused on 200 and 400. Um, they've chosen the route of a classic driver instead of a gallium driver. The main excuse is they want to be able to switch between the binary. You know, Because there's so much complexity in the compiler, they want to be able to switch between DL opening the binary compiler and using their own. Um, and with Gallium, the compiler is somewhat inter intertwined with the rest of the state, so it makes it a little, little more tricky. Things are very basic. Things are starting to work. So, like ES2 gears, texture spinning cube, and so on. So far, that's all with uh, with the uh, binary compiler. Although, yeah, it's just they need to hook up. They have a compi their own compiler, which is generating code which looks like it should work, um, but they need to, to hook it up. The, the guy who's done most of the compiler works actually in high school, and his school year started up again, so he has a little bit less time on it. <laughs> um, so, and then last but uh, not least is Fredrino. And this is uh, the one that I've been working on the most. Um, so far, that encompasses two generations of, of GPU. Um, the first generation is the Adreno 200. This is a, a GLES 2 class hardware, unified shader ISA. Uh, it's VLIW VEC4 plus scalar special function operation uh, with co dispatch, so dispatch at the same time. Um, then 
I think the first devices with the Adreno 320 shipped late last year and something I started uh, poking at early this year. It's um, GLES 2 or 3, or it's GLES 3 class hardware, um, OpenCL 1.1, but only embedded profile because of no double precision, uh, you know, 64 bit double precision. Uh, again, unified shader ISA, but it's a completely different unified shader ISA from the 200. Um, and it's what I call explicitly pipelined. The compiler has to um, deal with the fact that a result of an instruction is not immediately available and schedule other unrelated instructions in there. Um, from, a, <coughs> from a hardware feature standpoint, it's pretty nice. I mean, both of them support all, you know, texture types, you know, 2D, cube map, 3D, uh, 2 or 4X, multi-sample. And they both, <coughs> they both have a similar approach to, uh, to tiling. Um, unlike uh, Molly or SGX, which have a small fixed size tile, uh, these have actually a lar relatively large buffer internal to the GPU, which is not large enough for an entire frame buffer, but is large enough for, say, something like a 256 by 256 tile. Um, and the driver has a lot of flexibility into how to partition that and what size tile to, to render. Uh, the only constraint is that the color buffer or your multiple color buffers on the uh, 300, Adreno 300, since it supports multiple render targets, plus the depth and stencil need to fit in that tile buffer. Um, and but unlike some of the others, the driver has to explicitly handle the, the tiling, which means if the first draw operation isn't a clear, you have to bring the previous contents of the color and depth and stencil back into the, the internal buffer and then do your rendering and then explicitly bring that back out to system memory. Um, it does have some support, which is not implemented in the Gallium driver yet for a hardware binning pass. Um, the hardware binning pass basically allows it because it's normally in the naive approach you're executing the vertex and fragment shader for each tile. The hardware binning pass actually lets you do the vertex processing once instead of once per, per tile, which will be a nice performance boost for games, but uh, for stuff like GNOME Shell or Compass probably doesn't matter so much. Um, as far as devices, um, they're actually in about a bazillion different phones, but uh, uh, because the Qualcomm SOCs are in a lot of stuff, uh, the devices I'm having uh, work with to some degree for the uh, Adreno 2X uh, 200 stuff, I mostly did with the HP touchpad because it's got an unlocked bootloader and it's pretty, pretty easy to work with. Um, there's also some Freescale IMX5 devices, which, which have this GPU dating back pre-Qualcomm acquiring this GPU IP. Um, the uh, Adreno 300 stuff is starting to show up in a lot of devices, so at least the first device I had was the Nexus 4. Um, the uh, device I'm using mostly these days is this uh, Inforce IFC 6410 board. It's a small sort of like Panda board or Odroid sort of single board computer um, with SATA, gigabit Ethernet, uh, HDMI, two gigs of RAM. It's it's a pretty nice nice little setup. Um, the Snapdragon <coughs> uh, 600 and 800 are starting to show up in a bunch of devices. So the new Nexus 7. Uh, rumored to be in the new upcoming Nexus 5, uh, and so on. Um, <coughs> the Snapdragon 800 has the Adreno 330 instead of 320. Uh, I don't actually have any hardware with this, but with the blob driver, I can spoof out the GPU ID and tell the blob driver that it's on a 330. And it seems to work basically the same way as a 320. So hopefully, hopefully it just works when, when we get hardware. 
And if you look at Qualcomm's Android kernel branch, they've actually started pushing support for Adreno 400 stuff. So that will, I don't know, we'll see what that looks like when that comes. Um, so I mentioned uh, before about the driver explicitly handling uh, tiling. So if, if you, any of you are familiar with the Radeon hardware, you have a an indirect branch instruction in the command stream, so the command stream can branch to another command buffer. Compared to Radeon, the Adreno has a, one additional level of indirect branch, which is used for the per tile rendering. So the way we use this in Fredrino is, um, you know, when all the gallium clear and draw calls happen, we build up command stream in the normal way that Radeon or some other driver would, kind of ignoring the tiling. And then when we get a flush or a render target change or something that forces us to flush, we kind of mark this point in the command stream and build up per tile commands, branch back to uh, all the drawing, and then repeat for however many tiles. Um, that will, will change a little bit when I add support for the binning pass. I'm kind of I don't really like the way um, the blob driver does the binning pass because it actually builds two separate command stream buffers, but yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see on that. Um, so the um, Adreno 200 shader ISA was pretty fairly nice and simple. Um, there's, uh, let's say, two different instruction sizes. So like the Radeon 600 class stuff, it has two parts to a, a shader program. There's a control flow part, which is at the head of the shader program and has links out to groups of ALU instructions. Um, it's a little bit different from Radeon because the ALU instructions, instead of five scalar with some constraints in a packet. It's actually a VEC4 plus a, plus a, a scalar. Um, and interestingly, it's only 32-bit precision. So if you have a fragment shader and you ask for low or medium P precision, low or medium precision, you get high precision no matter what. Um, so the 300 ISA is a completely different thing, and it's uh, it's it's kind of nice, but it, it's a little bit more little bit more tricky for the compiler. Um, you have a bunch of basic uh, categories of instructions. Um, it's a scalar ISA instead of VEC4, but there's a uh, way that you can repeat a single instruction for successive registers to improve the instruction density. Um, but the compiler needs to explicitly handle the fact that a result instruction is not immediately available and potentially pad with no op instructions. So the typical case for a normal ALU instruction, the result is available three instruction slots later, with an exception that multiply add instructions need the third source register on the second cycle. So you can do a... Um, a sequence of multiply and multiply adds with only one no op pad between them. Um, and this supports a lot more types. So 16 or 32 bit float, 16 or 32 bit signed or unsigned. Um, because it's OpenCL class, uh, it also has support for normal sort of load store instructions, uh, you know, to read write memory. Um, so it's a much more uh, flexible uh, ISA. And uh, current status, uh, well, we've had a working Gallium driver for a while. The uh, A200 support, I think, was pushed early this year, and maybe, uh, I don't even remember when I pushed the A300 support, but it's been in, in Git Master for a while. Uh, now we finally have a DRM KMS driver uh, for the upstream kernel. So the Gallium and XF86 uh, video Fredrino parts will either work on the DRM KMS driver or on the 
Android FB Dev plus crazy GPU driver uh, so that you can use the same user space stuff either on an Android phone or you know or with the upstream driver um, oh yeah and because we have a DRM KMS driver Wayland works with with this so that's kind of something I like to see um, so as far as what we support, because it's a Gallium driver, we actually can support some desktop GL. It's kind of on a best effort basis. Like, i.e., if it's something the hardware can do and I can figure out how to make the hardware do it, I'll support it. Otherwise, yeah. um, and then, of course, uh, GLES 1 and 2. Um, still to do, I still need to implement multi-sample support and hardware binning pass for game performance and currently the compiler is not too clever so it ends up generating shaders that are probably on average twice as many instructions as they need to be um, but it's it's pretty usable at this stage you can run you know normal Linux desktop with GNOME shell run XBMC Xenotic a bunch of the Quake 3 uh, uh, based stuff um, a few things with a few rendering issues, but uh, uh, a lot less than a, a few weeks ago. So, <laughs> um, and uh, P.S. This presentation brought to you by Free and Open Source Graphics um, on an ARM SOC. <laughs> I can do that. Maybe. Uh, how does this work? Just pick it up. Yeah, I've got a fairly precarious setup right here with everything just balanced about to fall over. Yeah, we can do that too. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll put a link to the slides, but the last page on the slides has a, uh, links to more resources, you know, where to find the IRC channels for these various things, Git trees, blogs, so on, who's, who's working on what. So if you have some hardware and want to get involved, then, then definitely, as always, open source graphics needs more people. So, and, uh, oops. And that's it for the slides. I can do a bit of a demo. I don't know, how are we doing on time? Um, sorry, this is just about setup. So, okay, GNOME shell. So this thing is running uh, Fedora 19 with regular old uh, GNOME shell compiled. You know, it's built for GL, desktop GL. Nothing's recompiled to use GLES or anything special. So this was probably one of the first real things I had running um, because, well, it's kind of nice to have a, a, a UI to launch other things. So uh, XBMC was probably the next kind of real thing that I had running. Um, yeah, Cause you know, you have to be able to watch your movies somehow, right? Um, the next real thing that I think I have running. Unless the same problem that hit me earlier. Um, okay, maybe I should try to show that. Because that's what killed things earlier.
Yeah. I, so there's still one little bug that occasionally I lose VSync uh, events from the kernel, and that kind of leaves the X server stuck in a state where it's waiting for a page flip to complete. And that just kind of makes things go bad. Um, Right, that was, so I fixed a whole lot of things in the couple of weeks before LPC, and that was one thing I didn't have time to look at. So um, oh, this is really next to impossible to see um, because of the light. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's fairly dark, but this is uh, uh, dark places, and it's as long as uh, thermal throttling doesn't kick in, it should run about 60 FPS. Um, so okay, not the not the most uh, most challenging game there is from a GPU standpoint, but. Uh, it's it's faster than it was. The the hardware should be capable of a lot more, but because I don't implement the hardware binning pass and the compiler's not too clever yet, it's uh, there's room for improvement. Um, pardon? Yeah. So um, super tux card, I kind of like. It's uh, it's kind of fun. This this mostly uh, renders correctly, except for if you look at the uh, like trees, you might notice uh, it's using, as far as I can tell from looking at the API trace, it's using like a alpha to coverage trick uh, for blending rather than actually enabling GL blend. And since I don't implement MSAA yet, it just kind of doesn't work. But you know, other than that, it's it's. Fairly playable, 20 to 30 FPS. Um, there's, I mean, there's, like I say, the hardware can do a lot more than the, the driver can. There's a couple bugs, like the funny color skid marks. Yeah. Well, okay. There's some, there's some problems in the MIP map generation because the MIP map level generation in Gallium assumes you know how to tell the hardware to constrain the levels of details that it uses. So it doesn't use a level of detail that's not generated. So right now I'm hacking the MIPMAP generation to use nearest, which is actually not really right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't think I have a way to figure out how that actually works, except for maybe with GLES 3. I'm not sure. I, I haven't figured out a way to make the blob driver tell me how to do that. Um, pardon? <laughs> so the 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 way the blob driver generates the MIP maps. It has some way to generate all the MIP map levels in one go, which is kind of different from how the uh, Gallium U MIP map gen stuff works. I think what he's saying is that you should be able to write a program that does your own MIP Oh. Right, by True. Although, I mean, right now Gallium does the MIP map generation for you. Uh, right, right. But, I mean, you oh, oh, right, right, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, th that might work. But, yeah, there's a little bit of work to do there. Um, actually, hang on a sec. Let me start this in demo mode because I can't actually play it on this tiny little keyboard. actually 
plus I'm not trying to show off how bad I am at playing it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and this this is uh, Xenotic. It's I think mostly looks like it renders okay. I haven't spotted anything really obvious that's wrong. Um, but I, I might be overlooking some things. Um, so. <laughs> so there's a couple spots where it slows down a little bit, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, all, all of the games will, I think, benefit a lot from getting the, the hardware binning pass wired up. Uh, it's uh, Xenotic. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what engine. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, if uh, I can leave this running for a bit if anyone wants to come up and play around or whatever. Um, so, all right. All right, have a good lunch. <laughs>